All righty. Everybody hear me? Good? All right. So welcome, everybody, to what is the uh, last session block of the day. It just so happens to be the last session block before happy hour, so hopefully we'll get through this 40 minutes and we can drink to surviving the first day of the summit. So I'm glad you all can make it. This is uh, Vagrant Up, your Rackspace private cloud. Um, so who am I? By this slide here, you would guess that I'm the son of Ace Ventura. So if you haven't been to our Rackspace booth yet, there is a character artist. Hopefully he is there the rest of the week. He did a fantastic job. He sits there and draws you out on iPad mini and then posts it all over the internet for everybody to see. So my name is James Thorne. I'm a sales engineer with Rackspace in the private cloud team. Um, some background about myself, I graduated from Texas State University in San Marcos, Texas. Um, after that, I worked for the same university for about a year and two months as a Linux sysadmin. And after that, I was ready to get out of the university bubble. Uh, you, regardless if you're going to school or working for the university, you live in a bubble when you're at college. And I was ready to get out of it and see what the big bad world had to offer. Um, so with that, I was ready to take all the knowledge I learned at Texas State on the road. So I became a platform consultant at Red Hat. I was there for about another year and two months. Uh, I got to travel all over the country, saw some great cities, saw some not so great cities, uh, met some very interesting companies, and met some very smart people. Well, when I took that job, I had the travel bug, and it was 100% travel. And after that year and two months, that bug was itched. It was done. I was ready to plant some roots and uh, not travel everywhere. So there was also that thing called OpenStack. What was it? I kept hearing about it, reading about it, wasn't really sure what on earth it was. So who better to join to fully understand it and learn about it than Rackspace? And uh, I joined as a sales engineer in the private cloud team. And here I am nine months later um, talking at the OpenStack Summit. This is uh, my first big conference to go to, let alone speak at one. So I'm uh, very honored to be here and I appreciate you all coming. Um, so with that, before we get started, I'm going to do a live demo, but I'm going to do less of a live demo and more of a, a background demo, because if I actually did a live demo, we'd all be sitting here watching that screen for 30 or 40 minutes and just watching terminal text scroll by. So instead of doing that, I'm going to do the actual demo, put it in the background, and then at the end of the session, we'll come back and hopefully, if everything worked, It'll be done, and we'll have a demo Rackspace private cloud environment up and running uh, with one command, roughly, um, to begin using for self-learning, testing, troubleshooting, whatever. So with that, I'm going to close out the presentation here real quick. And that should be up there. All right, and I can, of course, see on my screen as well. Um, everything I talk about is going to be on my personal website, so you can go to thornlabs.net. Do a search for Vagrant, and it will be the second link titled Deploy Rackspace Private Cloud Entirely Within a Vagrant File Using VirtualBox or VMware Fusion. And where is my mouse? Let's see here. Can't see on earth my mouse is. Well, it's on the other screen. There we go. All right. So this entire post will detail how to set up Vagrant or where to go to get Vagrant set up, how to install VirtualBox or VMware Fusion. You can use either or with Vagrant. Uh, VirtualBox has a much lower barrier to entry because it's free. VMware Fusion, you have to, one, purchase, which is about $79, I believe. And then to use it with Vagrant, you need to also purchase a provider plugin from Vagrant, which is $89. So in total, my math is probably completely wrong, but it's about $140 to $150 to get started using Vagrant with VMware Fusion. So much higher barrier to entry. Um, I used to use VMware Fusion. I switched to VirtualBox for some reasons I'll touch on later. Um, but VirtualBox works just as well. Um, in addition to setting that up, uh, I have Vagrant base boxes available, which are essentially images, pre-made images that Vagrant uses to create the virtual machines. There are all sorts of Vagrant base boxes available on the internet. I just so happen to make my own. Um, so you can use these or other Ubuntu or CentOS Vagrant base boxes. So I'm going to skip down to the actual uh, meat of the conversation or the presentation. And which is the actual Vagrant file. So you'll see here I have a handful of different Vagrant files for different operating systems. I have Ubuntu and CentOS or different um, types of environments, non-HA or HA. For this demo, I'm just going to use the first one here, a RPC version 4.2.2 on Ubuntu server uh, with Neutron networking environment, non-HA. So I'm going to copy that curl command. 
which will, or which points to my GitHub account where I have all the Vagrant files, and when I paste it into the terminal, it's going to rewrite that file to be named Vagrant file, which is one word, and that's all Vagrant needs to get going. So with that copied, I'm going to open a terminal, and hopefully we all can see that. Um, I would do the demo, I would bring up the environment on my laptop, but I need a stable internet connection and I need a decent amount of bandwidth, so I'm actually going to log into my desktop back in Austin to do it. And yes, I'm going to go into a folder I've just set aside to put Vagrant environments. I'm going to make a directory, we'll just call it RPC version 422. I'm going to go in there and I'm going to paste that curl command. And now you will see I have the Vagrant file, just a quick cat, just so you there's stuff in it. There's stuff in it. I'm going to open Tmux, so if I lose connectivity, I can connect back in. Tmux is similar to screen if you've never heard of that. And then with that, I'm going to type Vagrant up and it's going to start doing its thing. So I'm going to leave that in the background. And I'm going to go back to the presentation. And hopefully at the end of the presentation, we can come back to that and it will say all done. And we can jump in real quick to the environment, run some commands, make sure it's working. And that'll be the background demo. So with that, why did I create these? Um, when I joined Rackspace about nine months ago, my OpenStack knowledge was very small. Um, at the time, I wasn't really sure, is it a hypervisor? What is it? I'm very confused as to why is it all modular? Why is it broken apart like this? So being a sales engineer, my job is going to be supporting this product and helping to sell it at a technical level. I obviously needed to get up to speed very quickly. So I could, of course, use DevStack or RDO, but I work for Rackspace. We have our product that we sell. And I took our deployment docs, our public-facing deployment docs, that detail how to set up the open source Chef server and then how we use Chef to deploy OpenStack. So I took those documents and started reading through them, started trying to understand how things worked. And my configuration management knowledge was very minimal as well. I had never used Chef. I had never used Puppet, SaltStack, or Ansible. Um, of course, we use Chef. And Chef by itself has a decently high learning curve. Uh, there are other config management tools that are much lower barrier to entry. Um, but as I learned Chef, it made more sense. And those deployment docs, start, I started to understand them. Unfortunately, I didn't have a physical server environment to actually install Rackspace Private Cloud on to troubleshoot and to demo it and to understand it. What I did have was my laptop, which is a fairly well-spec uh, Retina MacBook Pro, 16 gigs of RAM, quad-core processor, and that's enough to get a basic environment up. Nowhere near of what a real bare metal environment would be, but enough to learn on and to begin to understand how everything works, troubleshoot things, um, do customer demos, whatever. Um, so with that, I used VMware Fusion at the time, and I would go into VMware Fusion, manually create each of the virtual machines I needed. So you can install Rackspace Private Cloud as well as just vanilla OpenStack all within one virtual machine, but when we did an actual production customer deployment, we have controller nodes, it could be HA controller nodes, we also have compute nodes, we have sender nodes, and we also have uh, a node dedicated as the Chef server. You could couple the Chef server with the controller nodes, but it makes things a bit easier if you separate it out so you have less complexity in your environment. So that's what I wanted. I, so every time I created a fresh demo environment in Fusion, I would create by hand a uh, chef server virtual machine, a controller node virtual machine, and a compute node virtual machine, which is very tedious if you've ever used VMware Fusion or VirtualBox or any of the workstation hypervisors. You got to go in there, you got to name it, you got to set the proper amount of virtual CPUs you need, RAM, storage, virtual NICs, all that, and then point it to an ISO to do a fresh install of Ubuntu or CentOS. It takes time. Um, and as I would do this, it became more and more tedious. Obviously. It took more and more of my time away from actually learning OpenStack because that's what I wanted to do. I wanted to go through our deployment docs, go hit the OpenStack part, and begin to understand how this all worked, how it installed. And I don't remember if I was reading a DevOps article or whatever, but I stumbled upon the term Vagrant. And when you read the term Vagrant, it doesn't really tell you what the tool does, but I read that real quick, clear and concise summary of this is an easy way to create virtual machines from an image. And I started reading up on it, seeing how easy it was. There was already pre-made images out there. You could download those, install Vagrant, type Vagrant up, and boom, you have a virtual machine that you can begin doing stuff on. 
So I thought that was that light bulb moment. Oh my gosh, this is exactly what I'm looking for. I can now very quickly spin up a multi-node virtual machine environment using VirtualBox or Fusion and begin focusing on the OpenStack commands. So that's what I did. And within Vagrant, there's kind of two key pieces. First is the Vagrant base box, which is the image. It's been pre-made by somebody, yourself, whoever. And that's what Vagrant uses to create a virtual machine from. So no longer do you have to point to an ISO and um, install fresh. So you don't have to wait for that whole build cycle to go through. Now it's just a pre-made image that it sucks in within a couple minutes, maybe less, depending on how fast your workstation is. Um, and then it will apply the necessary amount of virtual CPUs, RAM, virtual NICs, uh, the host name, and then any other sort of provisioning scripts you point at. Vagrant has the capability of doing post-install stuff with shell scripts, Ansible, Puppet, Chef. Um, in the case of these Vagrant files, uh, it's all shell scripts, um, and I'll kind of reason or I'll detail why um, shortly. Um, but with that in place, I had the different virtual machine definitions. So I had one defined for the compute node, the controller node, the chef server, and possibly the sender node, and whatever else you may need if you need multiple compute nodes. Um, so now I can now use that and get an environment up quickly and begin focusing on the OpenStack commands. Great, saving lots of time, learning OpenStack, how we do it, why we do it this way, so on and so forth. Of course, I hit the next point of I've automated my virtual machine creation. Why am I still doing these OpenStack commands by hand? Uh, I got to a point where I learned all I was going to learn from our deployment docs. We did it one way or maybe a couple different ways. I had figured out all the different ways we did that deployment and why we did it, and I stuck with that. So OK, great. So I wanted to figure out how on earth could I automate the OpenStack install process. Um, and there's, because there's particular parts of the install that require user intervention. Um, so for the most part, I started out with taking all those manual steps, putting them into a shell script, because the majority of the commands, because or the majority of the commands, you can just copy and paste into a command line, and it does its thing, and then you go on to the next uh, command line, or next command in the process. So I started with that, and I quickly realized there was a handful of things that needed user intervention. The first of which is the chef environment file. So within Chef, there's the concept of an environment file, and you could have environments, Chef environments for production, QA, dev, whatever you want. And within that environment file, you can override default attributes that are set in the Chef cookbooks. We have our Rackspace Chef cookbooks that we use for private cloud, and they set default attributes. And I would use that Chef environment file to override the particular environment specific to my environment. Every environment's going to be different. It's going to have different subnets. It's going to have different NICs designated for particular uh, things within private cloud or OpenStack in general. And that's what that's for. So typically, I would just copy and paste that chef environment file from a text file into uh, the knife environment edit command. But in this case, I, of course, didn't want to be there to do that. So using the same knife environment command, you can use the from file command to point to a file. So I just took that chef environment file and dumped it to um, a file in slash temp or wherever and then just point a knife environment uh, from file at that file, and boom, there's your Chef environment file, you're good. You can now bootstrap uh, nodes within Chef, point it to that environment, and you're good to go. So that was the first kind of manual step that was taken care of. The next one is the different SSH commands. So within these Vagrant files, there's an order of operations to how the nodes come up. Uh, the first node that comes up is the controller node that's created by Vagrant, and then the compute node, and then optionally the sender node. And those really don't matter the order at which they're created, but the chef, or the chef uh, virtual machine it does have an order of operations. It needs to come up last, because in this environment, um, it's doing all the orchestration, if you will. It's logging into each node in the environment, issuing a bunch of commands, doing pre-setup, doing post-setup, and doing its own chef commands to get the environment set up. So it's important that that comes up last. But with that out of the way, how does that chef server log into each node in the environment? So of course, we're going to use SSH keys to do that. We don't want to deal with passwords. And in this environment, we know what the passwords are. Everything's vagrant. So the root user's password is vagrant, and any other user's password is vagrant. It's a demo environment. You don't need secure passwords. So 
you of course have to create keys on the Chef server, so that's the first step. But as you all are probably aware, when you go to create that first SSH key, it's going to prompt you for a password. Well, I don't want to deal with that. Luckily, the SSH keygen command has a command line switch, I think is dash N, uppercase N, that you can just do double quote, specify a blank password, and boom, you have your keys created, your public and private keys created with no password, so you, don't have, it won't, you won't be prompted for it later. Okay, so that's created, that's great. So next in that list is the chef server connecting via SSH to each node in the environment. Because it's a fresh environment and that chef server has never connected to any of those nodes, SSH is going to prompt you for the fingerprints for each node in that environment, and that's obviously user intervention, yes or no. Um, so how do you get around that? Well, one terribly insecure way to do it is to turn off the strict key host checking parameter in uh, the SSH D client configs. You could do that, it would work, not a suggested method, because if you did do that and you, even though it's a demo environment in the real world, if you connected to a server once, accepted the fingerprint, and then later connected to the same server, what you thought was the same server again, and it prompted you, there's probably a security issue there. It could be a man in the middle attack, whatever. So not the best way to do that. The better, more programmatic way to do it is to use the SSH key scan command. Um, and you can just run that command with the IP address or host name of every node, and it will echo back the fingerprint. And you can just dump that fingerprint to the user you're connecting from, ho known host file. And that's exactly what we do. Um, in this entire environment, a host file is laid down uh, on every node that points to the uh, static IP that I've set in the environment and the short host name. So I use an SSH key scan command to hit each one of those, dump that fingerprint in the root's known host file, and that problem is solved. Great. So now the last step is we still don't have the SSH public key on each node in the environment, so the chef server still can't log in. So you can, of course, use the SSH copy ID command to get that key over to that server. But this is the first time you're connecting. It's going to prompt for a password. So the two ways you can get around that are to use the SSH pass command, which would probably be cleaner. In my Vagrant files, I'm using expect. Um, so you just got to kind of know the process and the things that are prompted to have expect work for you. And that's what I use. I've used it since I've created these. It's worked pretty well. Um, so that's how I get around that. And then at that point, all the SSH keys are in the environment, and the Chef server can log in and begin bootstrapping the nodes. So with that, real quick, just to kind of show you what that looks like. And this is going to be kind of a pain. Let's see here. So on. Let's see here. So here's the Chef environment file that I mentioned. Um, that's a whole other discussion in and of itself to talk about. Oh, there's a screen right there I can look at. Um, so moving past that, um, I just used the cat command, as mentioned earlier, to dump that to a file and then pull it in with knife environment from file, which you can see right here. And then there's that SSH keygen command with the dash n, double quote, double quote. There's the key scan commands. Uh, typically, I will use the short name in the environment just because it's easy to read for newcomers or anybody, really. Um, instead of having to memorize the different IP addresses that are used. And you can see it's dumped to root's uh, known host file. I install expect because the particular base boxes I'm using don't happen to have it installed. You can see it sends the Vagrant password to that particular node in the environment. And then moving on from there, so that's done for each node in the environment. And then moving on from there, um, before we actually get into the chef portion of it, there's some pre-setup for a sender node um, that is done. You, of course, don't have to use a sender node. Uh, but typically, with a sender environment, you're going to set up a dedicated hard drive or RAID array or partition that you will then layer uh, LVM on top of and then create a volume group called sender-volumes. Um, in this case, I can just do the same thing with a file. It makes it easier. Um, so I'm just creating a 10 gig file, making a loop interface, making an LVM physical uh, volume group, and then doing an LVM volume group called cinder-volumes. And for the sake of our Chef cookbooks, that's all it needs to get going. When the Chef cookbooks run and they get to the cinder node, they will see cinder-volumes as a volume group, and uh, it will do everything it needs to set up uh, cinder in the environment. Um, so with that, and I also put this is one of the kind of the oddities of doing this in the local environment, especially with Vagrant. I put all those commands in rc.local on uh, 
the sender node, because if you do a vagrant reload and you don't have those commands in rc.local, it won't get reset back up. Um, and a typical production environment, you wouldn't need that there because, again, you'd be using a dedicated partition and LVM would be aware of all that and keep track of all that. So with that pre-setup out of the way, we now move into the actual Chef deployment. Um, so looking at the top here, first, I, I have it broken up into three different um, nodes. I have the controller node, the compute node, and the sender node. Uh, first, I point to the environment that we created earlier. I just called it RPC version 422. Um, and all, so there's, what is it, five commands there. You could do all this in one line, and I did that for a while, but I ran into bizarre issues where it would run through and the Chef client run would fail, and it would do the run through again. And because of the way Chef does indexing, so you can do searches within Chef, it didn't know it was there. So it would just sit there, and I have it just like a continuous while loop, because I don't expect it to fail, um, and I don't want to have to, you could put in there, if it fails five times, just stop everything, because this entire script has a parameter set to um, close out on any sort of error, or exit one return. Um, and doing it this way, step by step, kind of alleviated that problem a little bit. A little more wordy in the Vagrant file, but uh, for a newcomer, or for a newcomer, it's just it's easier to read and understand it. Um, so after the controller node is bootstrapped, uh, I apply the different chef roles. So in this case, single controller and the single network node. You could separate out a network node if you wanted to, but for the sake of RAM and resources on your workstation, just put it all in one. And then um, I sleep for 15 seconds to wait for the chef server to catch up on its indexing because the knife SSH command that comes next relies on that indexing because I'm searching for name controller one the entire environment is severely under-resourced, so the chef server, I think, is given a gig of RAM, which is not enough. The controller node is given two gigs of RAM, which is very much not enough. Um, so I just, I give it time to kind of catch up, and in some cases, that's not enough, but with the, the continuous while loop, it will eventually catch and just start going with the build. Um, so that's done. The controller node has to be done first, and then you move on to the compute node, and then the sender node, and then any other compute nodes you may need um, and have in your environment. So once that's all done, and I mean, if you have a fast environment, it may take anywhere from 20 minutes to an hour. It depends largely on your internet connection um, and how fast your gear is. Um, if I did it from my laptop on a fairly fast connection, it takes about 30 minutes. Um, so that's what you can expect there. And at this point, once all that's run through and done, you have a basic OpenStack or private cloud environment to begin using. Some additional things that I've done, and this is one thing I've come across with DevStack or possibly RDO when you do installs on your local workstation is, when you bring up an instance, you don't have connectivity out of that instance to the internet. So how do you do anything? Great, I can spin it up. What can I do with this? I can spin up another instance and they can talk to each other. Okay, cool. I want to go talk to my package manager or pull down something from GitHub, whatever. Um, these additional steps allow you to have connectivity out from your instance to the internet, and then also connectivity back in. They allow you to set up floating IPs um, so you can connect to that instance from your workstation and not have to jump into the controller node, and then assuming the instance is in a software-defined network, then jump into a network namespace and then be logged into that instance. Um, you could, of course, log in from the console, but a lot of the cloud images have password login turned off. Um, and it's strictly SSH key based. And from a console within Horizon, you really can't push that key and log in unless you have an admin pass set up or something like that. Um, and typically in a production environment, these changes wouldn't be here or these modifications wouldn't be here. And I'm working around limitations in VirtualBox and Vagrant. Um, so it was similar to those post or those pre-install steps for Cinder earlier. I go through and where's my cursor? So let's see, we'll do the controller node. So I log into the controller node. Um, on each node in the environment, I have everything separate, separated out on di different virtual NICs. So ETH zero on every node, I just pretend doesn't exist. That's strictly for Vagrant to log in via SSH to the node. VirtualBox has weird ways it does networking, and I just leave that alone and pretend it doesn't exist. ETH one is where I begin separating out the services. So ETH one on every node is the OpenStack services and APIs. ETH2 is going to be a dedicated network for Neutron GRE tunnels. And then ETH3 is going to be 
uh, my neutron provider network, if you will. So think of whatever workstation you're bringing up this environment on as your router outside to the internet. So if you use VirtualBox or VMware Fusion, if you have all these different networks, it's going to create virtual adapters on your laptop with .1 addresses. So 240.1, 250.1, whatever. In this case, I'm using 244 as the network. And the .1 address lives on the workstation I'm bringing the environment up on, which just so happens to be my desktop back in Austin. Um, so that's what I'm going to use as my neutron provider network and for floating IPs. So I log into the controller node. I delete that IP off E3. F3, um, I bring up an open vSwitch bridge called BR-F3, and that was set up by our chef cookbooks. And then I add that IP address to that open vSwitch bridge. You don't have to do that, but if you want to be, if you want to have connectivity on that network within your controller node or compute node, you need to have that IP set. Um, but if you're just logging in from your workstation, you don't have to, as long as your workstation has an IP on that network. Um, I then add that port E3 into the open vSwitch uh, bridge, and then I go in there and do the same commands with an rc.local, and then also I sleep for a bit, so if you do a reload on uh, the Vagrant node, it waits for the services to come up, make sure they're up, and then goes through and does all this, and then it restarts a couple uh, OpenStack networking services to have the changes take effect, um, similar to what was done with the sender uh, pre-setup earlier. Um, and you don't need that. Again, it's strictly for if you do a reload of the environment uh, and it all comes up properly after the fact. If you're like me and you typically bring up an environment, use it for maybe 30 minutes and then destroy it, those aren't that necessary. But for a completeness sake, um, those are nice to have, especially if you need to reload the Vagrant VM to forward ports. Because um, right now, for example, if I wanted to access the Horizon dashboard from my desktop in Austin, I would need to forward particular ports to that desktop and then use SSH to get to those ports from my laptop, and it becomes kind of a mess, but that would allow you to do that and bring the environment back up into a proper state. Um, so those are done on the controller node, or those modifications are done on the controller node and the compute node. And at that point, the last piece of the puzzle here for us to have instance connectivity out to the internet, there's different ways you can do this. This is just the way I decided to do it. I turned the chef server into a router, essentially. So using IP forwarding and IP tables, you can turn any uh, Linux box into a, a router of sorts. Um, and you could set aside another vagrant virtual machine to do this if you wanted it on its own. But for the sake of RAM and CPU resources on the workstation, I just coupled it with a chef server. After it does its deployment, it's not really working that hard after the fact. Um, essentially, so as I mentioned, turn on IPv forwarding, um, forward any packets that come from ETH2 on the chef server out ETH0. So because of the way VirtualBox does networking, the only NIC on any of the virtual machines that has internet connectivity is ETH0. Well, if you ever spun up multiple VirtualBox VMs, they all have the same IP address, and they may all have the same MAC address, but they're all isolated from each other. They can't talk to each other unless you add another NIC and on the same network on each, and then they can communicate with each other. It's kind of a pain to work around, but what this allows us to do is ETH2 on the Chef server is in that 244 network, that Neutron provider network. So when I created that Neutron network within OpenStack, the gateway, instead of being .1 on 244, which can't go anywhere because that um, network does not have connectivity out, I instead point to the 244 address on the Chef server, which I think in this case is just .10. So then when you bring up an instance on that provider network, the gateway will go to the Chef server, and then with these IP tables commands, that packet is coming in, ETH2, it'll then masquerade it out, ETH0, and it will go out to the internet, and then it'll come back in properly. Now, it'll only come back in properly if you set promiscuous mode within VirtualBox on uh, the virtual adapter on your workstation. If you don't, that packet's gonna go out, try to come back in, and it's gonna stop at the virtual adapter on your laptop. Um, and you can demo that by just doing a ping, and I think the response is destination, host unreachable, or something like that. And if you look up that, the actual standard definition of what that means, it means the packet's made it out to its destination, but it can't come back in. Um, so at that point, with all those changes in place, that is the extent of the shell scripts within the Vagrant file. And real quick, just to show you the three parts of this Vagrant file. The first part 
down here is what you need without a doubt. Without this, you can't do anything. Um, so there's too much to show it on the screen, but the first piece at the top is just some vagrant syntax. The next piece is the vagrant base box that's going to be used. So in this case, it's a Ubuntu server 1204.4 box. You could also use CentOS uh, 6.5 if you wanted to. The next thing turns off shared folders. I don't need it in this environment. Um, and then you get into the actual virtual machine definition. So you have the controller node, and you can see the host name being set. You can see it pointing to a particular shell script that exists at the top of the Vagrant file. Um, then you have all the different virtual adapters that I mentioned. And then at that point, you also have uh, the parameters to set memory size and the number of virtual CPUs to set broken up into VMware Fusion or VirtualBox. Um, and you can see here for the VirtualBox one, um, right here above the two end statements, that's the setting that sets that promiscuous mode for uh, the virtual adapter. And that has to be done here. You can't go into your workstation, fire up a terminal, and set promiscuous mode on that virtual adapter there. It doesn't work for whatever reason. Um, but doing it here, doing allow all, there's also another parameter. It's like allow VM or device or something like that. But allow all worked properly. Um, and if we continue scrolling through, you're going to see the definition for the compute node and then the sender node. And then the chef server node, which doesn't need as many virtual adapters. And you'll notice it has uh, references to two shell scripts, the common script and the chef script. So to kind of show you real quick what those look like, if we jump back to the top of the Vagrant file. Here's the common script. It exists all right here. It just drops a host file into every node in the environment. So you can SSH into a node or reference a node via its short name or its IP address. Um, and then the chef script is what does all the deployments. So here is the curl command to pull down a uh, shell script that will install the open source SS or chef server. Um, set permission, set an executable bit on it, uh, set a URL environment variable for it to reference, actually install it, change into root's home directory, pull down the chef cookbook's uh, GitHub repo, and then check out the particular branch it needs, get all the submodules in place, and there's the, uh, let's see, upload the cookbooks to the open source chef server, upload the roles, and then there's the chef server, or the chef environment file that it uses, and at that point, um, that's everything that's needed within the Vagrant file. Um, so before I automated all this, it was just that bottom piece I was using, just those virtual machine definitions. And I was doing all the above stuff by hand, which obviously is extremely tedious. Um, so with this in place, let's see how this build is doing. And of course, it doesn't work all the way. So this brings me to my next piece the various problems that I've encountered with these Vagrant files. So these Vagrant files have a lot of external dependencies. I need to pull down the open source Chef server from Chef. I need to pull down Chef client from Chef. And that all comes from AWS um, based on the URLs that we have in here. Um, in addition to that, I need to pull from the Git, I need to pull from a GitHub repo. Um, what else is there? There's all those different external things that for the most part, probably 85% of the time, work. I did this an hour ago, and it worked within 30 minutes. Of course, I'm on stage, and it doesn't work at all. And this is one of the main things I've run into is this is the um, open source Chef server install script that stalled out on downloading the Chef server um, Debian package. Um, so I've encountered this before. Sometimes I would do a build late at night and it wouldn't work. Or I would do a build on Sunday morning and it wouldn't work. Typical times where you would expect maintenance to happen um, on all these external um, things. You could probably code around it. You could also pull down all those files, stick them somewhere that you know will work and get around that. Um, but the point of these Vagrant files is to spin up a fresh RPC environment every time just the way we deploy it at Rackspace. Um, because I use these for customer demos, I use these to troubleshoot um, questions that I have or on our community forums, whatever. Um, and I can, when it works, lay down the Vagrant file, type Vagrant up, go do something else, 30 minutes later, come back, and I have my environment, I can begin doing my work. Um, and do whatever I need to do. So I'm going to cancel out of that. And at this point, so one last bit here, depending on where this failed, you could either destroy the entire environment and just redo it, or in this case, because it failed at the chef server, 
I could, instead of destroying the entire environment, just do Vagrant Destroy Chef. Yes. And then, once it does its thing, do Vagrant Up Chef again. Um, to the, you could probably do that to the point where it does any sort of configuration on any of the nodes in the environment. If it's hit that spot, you could go in there and maybe manually take off the changes, but it'd be easier just to vagrant destroy everything and then vagrant up it again, and hopefully it works. We could do this again, and it could work in 30 minutes. Um, we're, of course, not going to sit here and watch it. Um, but that's all I have to talk about, about why and how I made this vagrant file. Um, so with that process failing me on stage, um, that is all I have to discuss with that. Everything I talked about will be on my website, thornlabs.net. Do a search for Vagrant. Um, it should be the second link. Follow me on Twitter. I'm jthorn on uh, Freenode. Are there any questions? Yes. Um, that could, of course, be done. Um, actually, some of our, uh, oh, I'm sorry. Um, he asked if I could do the same sort of thing uh, using containers or Docker. Um, you very well could. Um, I believe some of our Rackspace developers are actually working on that for another sandbox type environment. Um, and they've utilized Docker. And I think in this case, it was Linux containers. So, but uh, what you can do with this, I mean, if it's a shell script, you can put it in this and provision a Vagrant machine after the fact. Um, you could probably spin up RDO with this. You could probably spin up DevStack with this because all those need some sort of base operating system or virtual machine to install. Um, so, yeah. Oh, there's a microphone. I'll repeat it. Sorry, go ahead. The which repos? Um, I mean, to pull down from the, so he asked if the, uh, the OpenStack APIs are the same as the Rackspace public cloud. So yeah, they are the same. Yeah. I'm not familiar, you used Vagrant Destroy Chef. I'm not, so kind of two parts. One, I'm not familiar with that syntax, so could you explain that a little? And then number two, in my experience, if you do Vagrant up and something stops, you can just start over again, and it'll usually pick up where it's at. Is there some special reason that doesn't work in your case? Um, it's hard to say because I've taken those manual steps that I did before and just hit them one for one um, and just pasted them into the shell script. Um, I'm expecting each one of those to succeed because, I mean, if you're doing it manually, of course, you go back, figure out what's wrong. In this case, because I want it as hands-off as possible, I'll probably just vagrant destroy it and vagrant up it again. Um, I'm not familiar with how it would pick up, actually, so I'd be interested to hear about your use case there. I, um, I've just, if, uh, well, often it was because I had a mistake in my script, sure. so it would fail at step 12. Sure. And then I correct my step 12, and I vagrant up again, and it just picks up where it left off. Sure. OK. So, so that's my experience. I, but also, what's, I've seen vagrant destroy. That takes out the whole thing. But right. wh why vagrant destroy chef? Does that take out a particular step? Or? Correct. Yeah, that pr takes out a particular virtual machine in the environment. In this case, there was four nodes, the chef server, or what I've designated as the chef server, the controller node, the compute node, and the sender node. So vagrant destroy will get rid of all of them. Vagrant destroy chef will get rid of that one. Vagrant destroy controller one will get rid of the controller node, oh, so okay. on and so forth. Okay, yeah. I've only used Vagrant on one machine, so yeah. you put like a master file over. Yeah, within the Vagrant file, so typically you just have the base box, and then that's all you really need, and then of course the, the standard Vagrant syntax. But the different virtual machine definitions I have is what spins up a multi node virtual Vagrant environment. Okay, so. Okay. So was that all in the same, I'm sorry, I didn't follow. Oh, no worries. Yeah. Was it all in the same Vagrant file? Then? Yes, everything is contained within that one Vagrant file. Okay. So, yep. Thanks. Thanks. Yeah, sure. And everything that in, everything I showed you is uh, up on my website. It's in my GitHub repo, so feel free to fork it, do whatever you want with it, make it better, send some pull requests, um, and kind of help me too. So any other questions? Good? Cool. All right. Thank you, everybody. Uh, go enjoy your happy hour. Thanks.